When there's a problem, the cry goes out, do something, intervene. And um, we have three absolutely excellent speakers to talk about interventions in, the, in, in different areas, non-pharmaceutical interventions, vaccines, and treatments. And we're going to start with Professor Lucy Yardley of the University of Bristol, who's an uh, expert on behavioral interventions and uh, a member of the UK government's scientific advisory group on emergencies or SAGE. Lucy, over to you. Thanks very much, Jonathan. I'm just going to share my screen if I can. There we go. Um, can everybody see that? Right. Um, I not yet shared, Lucy. Oh, uh, I did share, but I said it hasn't come through then. Um, going back to. There. Is that better? That's better, thank you. Excellent. Um, one minute, I'm, <laughs> I'm just going to get it onto the... Uh, excellent. Um, I, I'm trying to share my perspective as being... Um, inputting the behavioural science to SAGE. Um, and of course, at the beginning of COVID-19, uh, there were so many unknowns. So that actually, what is easiest for me is to summarise what was known, which fitted easily into one slide. So we knew that if people don't breathe the same air as someone who is infected or touch them or anything they have touched or breathed on, they wouldn't be infected. So in terms of informing how to use uh, MPIs to reduce spread of infection, um, complete avoidance of, of contact we knew would work. So that's why lockdown was the obvious way to go. Um, also extremely effective PPE. So that's what had to be used in hospitals. And there's evidence from spring in 2020 um, that if this is widely and proactively supported by everybody from policymakers uh, down to the UK population. It does work, but it has very serious economic, social and psychological costs. So that brings us on to uh, all the other unknowns, which are to do with how you can actually live your lives uh, while using MPIs to prevent transmission. And the first set of unknowns was uh, about the transmission characteristics that would mean which MPIs were going to work best and were most important. So at, we didn't know how much the infection was being spread by droplets, which would be prevented by two meter distancing or mask wearing within two meters, or were being spread by FOMAX, which would be prevented by hand washing and surface cleaning, or were, uh, was the spread happening by aerosols, which uh, are prevented by ventilation, mask wearing, and avoiding loud vocalization. Um, and all of these uh, unknowns, you know, although we partly know some of them now, they remain partly unknown. So another set of partly unknowns, um, who is most likely to transmit infection, when and how? And this is important to know so that you know, who do we need to avoid, to test, to isolate, and when? Uh, so for example, we didn't know uh, the proportion of people that had asymptomatic infection and whether they transmit while they are asymptomatic. The same goes for people that are pre-symptomatic. We don't know how long people continue to uh, be infectious after they've become ill. Um, for a long time, there was uncertainty about uh, the relative transmission by children versus adults. Uh, that's beginning to be known a bit more, but uh, still not completely clear. And the idea of a super spreader, um, although there was sort of some anecdotal evidence of that very early on, uh, it's only increasingly with modeling that we see possibly the importance of these events. Um, and we still don't know fully uh, 
which people are going to be super spreaders and why. Another set of unknowns. Um, what NPIs will the UK population adhere to and how effectively? Uh, so, you know, we were constantly being asked, you know, how will people behave? Uh, you know, will people test and self-isolate when ill? Uh, will they quarantine when they're uh, in contact or possibly have been in contact with people, especially if they're asked to do that over and over again and it's uncertain how much contact they've had? Uh, will people avoid mixing other, with other households? Um, and will they do social distancing, hygiene of hands and surfaces and mask wearing? And will they do it effectively? So, you know, will they wear masks in the ways that you really need to do that? Um, and then there's the question about what are the key barriers and facilitators to adhering to each of the NPIs and how can they be addressed? Now, there's such a huge number of these unknowns uh, that I've summarized it in this one slide. I can't possibly go through them all. But uh, to give you a sample, there's uh, the question of uh, how other people behave, their opinions. There's the regulations and how they're enforced. Uh, there's the context you're in and whether the environments help you to adhere or uh, make it difficult to adhere. There are financial barriers. So we know that's a huge barrier to whether people can, for example, self-isolate and quarantine. Um, and then there's uh, whether people understand what the uh, reasons are, uh, whether they understand how to do these things and why you need to do them, when you need to do them, uh, and whether they think they can do it. Uh, Another very common barrier uh, is mental health. And some people say that, you know, they just cannot uh, isolate themselves for, from other people for, for long periods of time, or they cannot do without going out for exercise. So that comes on to the final set of, um, you know, factors that may be affecting things, uh, people's motivations. Um, so as well as the conscious motivations like uh, whether it, their, their emotional well-being or their need to uh, uh, do what their employers want them to do or not let down work colleagues. Uh, there's all these kinds of motivations. There's also uh, the unconscious motivations such as habit. So it's been very difficult for everybody to overcome habits that are from whole lifetime such as uh, you know, hugging people that you know well uh, and, and uh, going to uh, sit close to them. Uh, and of course, in relation to all of these barriers and facilitators, they are different for different uh, people within the population. So, uh, you know, the, the things that young people are really motivated by and the things that people that are at very high risk from illness are motivated by are completely different. So uh, I want to finally talk about um, how one tries to address these kinds of unknowns in the context of an, an epidemic. Um, what theory, methods and evidence can we use to understand people's perceptions, experiences and behaviour in response to the pandemic and MPIs? Um, well, like so many people that were trying to provide advice in the pandemic, we had a terrible shortage of information. And actually, I was relying on journalists. We were asking about uh, in the last session about the role of journalism. I was, uh, you know, as soon as I got up in the morning, uh, relying on journalism really to bring me the news from overall, over the whole world of what was happening, how people in other countries were reacting. Um, so we did have some objective measures of behavior. So, you know, traffic levels, and footfall in particular places. Uh, and, and then we did have surveys of self-reported attitudes and behavior, um, but these were incredibly problematic. Um, now, in, there are some ways that you can make good use of surveys as we saw earlier today with the REACT study. 
Um, but the problem is with these surveys is that the people that answer them are, are not typical of the whole population. Now, in React, 70% um, of people do not uh, participate. And the problem with that is that if you're asking people about their behavior, uh, the people that don't take part in surveys tend to be very different than, from the people that do. So you only find out about the opinions and behavior of people that take part in the surveys. So that was really difficult. Um, we tried to make international comparisons. Um, but it's difficult to compare very different countries. People say, uh, why did we not follow the model in you know, South Korea, Hong Kong, Sweden? These are very, very different countries in so many ways. And it was very uncertain the extent to which things that were working over there uh, would work over here or how they could be made to work over here. So we ended up using, uh, to a large extent, theory and expert consensus um, so one good thing was like having lots of different people inputting from different disciplines with different viewpoints, um, you know, that really did help. So finally, um, in this uncertain situation, how can we draw conclusions and make recommendations? Well, what I would say is that our ex expert consensus based on theory and uh, what we could glean as fast as we could was better than completely uninformed guesswork. Um, I'm fairly confident of that because um, I saw some of the uninformed guesses uh, and I think they were uh, uh, worse. <laughs> um, but this was a far from ideal situation. So looking forward to the future, um, I think preparing for the next pandemic, as we all know, we really must this time. Um, I think we need permanent networks of data and evidence compilation um, in, in terms of behavior. So uh, we already have uh, people setting up living systematic reviews, um, though those are obviously actually quite delayed because it takes time to collect data. We need automated digital observational data collection. Um, and obviously one has to sort of watch out for the big brother aspects of that, you know, but if you're talking about in public places, that can definitely be done. And I think we should have representative uh, uh, panels of members of the public uh, with, from diverse communities and settings uh, ready to provide really rapid views, feedback and co-design into the advice and the interventions. Us, uh, so that we could tap into that in the future. Uh, thanks very much for asking me to input my opinions today. Thanks very much indeed, Lucy. They're extremely thought provoking and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions when we get to the discussion section. Uh, we will move on immediately to Adam Finn, who is Professor of Paediatrics at the University of Bristol leads the University of Bristol's uh, uh, group uh, on, on uh, COVID-19 research response, Bristol Uncover, as you can see there, and uh, has a lifelong or career-long research interest in immunology and the evaluation of vaccines. Over to you, Adam. Thanks, Jonathan, um, and thanks to George and all for the invitation to speak uh, today. Um, so I'm a paediatrician, as you just heard. I'm also a vaccine trialist. I've been doing trials of vaccines, mostly in children, since the mid-1990s, but currently, of course, mostly doing work in adults uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, my Twitter handle is there. I tweet about vaccines, so if that's a topic you're interested in, please follow me. And the Bristol Uncover is the group um, that I coordinate in Bristol that's covering a, a number of different areas of research on COVID-19. Um, so, um, George gave me some very clear instructions to, to talk about unknown, so I'm not going to show any data at all in the next uh, few minutes, I'm just going to talk about things that we don't know about. Uh, but Phil talked earlier about getting people to say what they'd got wrong, so I thought I'd just put in a list of things that I could immediately think of that I got totally wrong about this. First of all, I stood outside Bristol Temple Meads doing an interview on the local BBC TV um, at the beginning of March. Um, and there was a problem that 
Chinese people were being shunned by the British. And I stood there and said, look, you don't need to worry about this outbreak. It's just like flu, uh, nothing special. <laughs> so so they, every time I speak to the BBC now, they kind of pull my leg about that. <clears throat> um, I also, because we have a lab that does PCR testing, uh, naively imagined that we could set up a PCR assay and contribute to the testing effort rapidly in March. Um, and actually that's taken about six months to, to, to get an assay to work and to get hooked into the uh, national system in any shape or form, even as a researcher. Uh, shortages of reagents, um, uh, people trying to take all our equipment away, all sorts of uh, uh, obstacles. Um, I also thought, and I'll come back to this in a minute, that people would actively want to find out whether the vaccines would uh, um, influence viral shedding and, and infer from that how well they might influence transmission. And that's turned out not to be a priority uh, for most of the vaccine developers. Um, and like everyone else, I imagine that the first vaccines through would only be at very best uh, moderately efficacious. And we've all learned that was wrong in the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, so we do have some data, uh, not yet published, but suggesting that the, uh, at least the first couple of vaccines are highly efficacious. What we don't know is whether the kind of disease that's being prevented in these studies is really going to be accurately predictive of the kind of disease we really need to prevent, which is severe uh, and potentially fatal illness in the elderly and high risk groups. Uh, and as I mentioned, we don't really anticipate getting much information at this point on impact on transmission, which would be uh, the justification for giving a vaccine more widely in the population. Uh, and we don't really know how many different vaccines will be needed. Um, uh, that paradigm is unclear. If you look at the other vaccines that we use for other diseases, in most cases, we have one vaccine or uh, at the most two or three. We don't have dozens of vaccines against diseases. Normally, in the normal world, a vaccine comes in and fills the space and makes it quite difficult for others to come behind. So that's a, that, that, uh, that is an uncertainty that we face at the moment as we have all these vaccines coming through. Um, we do have information now on the immune responses induced by some of these vaccines in the published literature, but we don't really know what those responses mean in terms of uh, their potential to protect. And serological correlates of protection, normally we use antibodies rather than T-cell measures, uh, are notoriously difficult to establish, uh, at least ones that are uh, really reliable, partly because of the difficulties um, uh, interpreting those levels. Enough antibody for me might not be enough antibody for you for various reasons, but also getting standardization across laboratories for these tests is, is really very challenging, particularly if they're functional tests that really measure whether antibodies can prevent viruses from infecting cells. Um, and uh, another challenge to this, uh, which is, uh, parallel with the highly effective human papillomavirus vaccines that we now have and are using, is that if vaccines are really, really effective and you have very few vaccine failures, it actually makes it much more difficult to establish a correlate because you need vaccine failures to measure their antibodies and compare with people who are apparently protected to establish where that threshold lies. So if these vaccines all turn out to be very effective, getting a correlate will be even harder. A uh, lot of discussion about safety and, um, you know, people want absolutes here where absolutes are not available. Of course, tens of thousands of people are being given these vaccines and in a very systematic way, we're collecting information about what we call solicited adverse events. In other words, we ask them whether they've uh, to measure their temperature, they've got a fever, we ask them to report what's going on in their arm if they have other generalized uh, symptoms after immunization. We also ask them to report anything uh, that, that seems unusual and serious here means something like something that requires you to go to the doctor or seek medical attention or get seriously ill in some way. And we also try and pick up you know, unexpected adverse reactions where it's pretty clear that something has been caused by the vaccine. So we get that kind of information. But the honest truth is that what people are really worried about is the idea of some rare idiosyncratic late onset side effect. Uh, and when those have happened in the past, and they have happened on a handful of occasions, uh, 
they they always come out of the blue. Uh, you know, if you you give a, a vaccine to hundreds of thousands of people and one in fifty thousand develops a problem, you don't get that from the initial studies. Um, uh, it comes out later, uh, and so we have to acknowledge, particularly with new vaccine platforms, that it's possible that something might happen that we don't really plan for or expect once we roll these vaccines out. People don't like to hear that, but that's the fact of life. And you, you have to get used to risk benefit balances here. Uh, and when you're confronted with a pandemic that's killing lots of people, you can't then come out with something that you're completely sure about being totally safe uh, in, in a timely way. Uh, you have to take some degree uh, cope with some degree of uncertainty. Uh, indirect effects is really what I am most interested in. And uh, that, what that means is the impact of a vaccine when you give it to a population. So the, the, the almost universal concept of vaccines that people have is that you take your child to the doctor, the child receives a vaccine and so that he or she will not get that disease, whether it's whooping cough or polio or whatever. But the reality is that we, in, with the one exception of tetanus, we give vaccines to a population in order to control the circulation of that infection in the human population and eliminate it. And we protect people indirectly, people who never had the vaccine, people who had it and didn't make a protective response, uh, people who've had the vaccine and, and got uh, their, their immunity has, has waned and they have become vulnerable again. All of those people are protected indirectly by the program. Now, these things are hard to study, and we really have very little idea uh, about, uh, about these vaccines coming through. And in fact, you don't need to do this for licensure because regulators see vaccines very like drugs. They want to know that they have the, the direct effect on the person uh, being receiving it and that, that they want a portfolio of data on safety. Uh, so in fact, because there isn't a requirement to do this, even though it's permitted, uh, there's a kind of half-hearted approach to doing this and everyone takes the view that, well, we'll find out about that later. Well, that's unfortunate because it would really uh, profoundly affect how we would plan to use this. And we're trying to make these plans right now in a rush because we've got a pandemic on our hands. And it's likely that these highly efficacious vaccines will have indirect effects, but we're not really, we don't really know what there will be and, and it would be useful to have that information. Uh, because ultimately, while we can protect the vulnerable, if we really want to bring the pandemic to an end, we have to stop transmission within the broader population, which is mostly people who are not particularly vulnerable to serious illness. Um, there are, of course, the obvious ethical issues um, with anything new, but there are some new ethical issues emerging quite rapidly at the moment, because we're, we're, we're rapidly coming to a point where we're going to have vaccines available, almost certainly, uh, and at that point, it becomes much more difficult to do placebo controlled randomized trials of other vaccines because uh, randomizing someone to a placebo when there's a, a, an effective vaccine available to them uh, is, well, clearly unattractive to them, but actually probably quite unethical, particularly if they're at high risk of serious illness. Um, we also need to think about the placebo recipients in the studies we're already doing and what we say to them. Uh, as vaccines come through and, and what are what are uh, what, well, what we should say to them and what their expectations are. Um, and then there's a really um, awkward and difficult ethical dilemma about, well, if, if you're going to start immunizing uh, people in the places where uh, that vaccines available, but who are, are capable of doing clinical trials, surely you should be doing the trials elsewhere where there isn't vaccine available. But if that's the case, then what you're essentially saying is that those other places are places that are not going to be given vaccine when vaccine is available, and that's wrong. Uh, there should be equity about vaccine delivery. So all of those kind of questions are essentially, uh, you know, staring us in the face, and we're struggling to answer them. <clears throat> uh, of course, uh, questions come up about rollout and how we prioritize. And, and in the work I do for WHO, we're really struggling with this at the moment, as uh, are the local uh, NITAGs like the JCVR in the UK. What are we trying to do? Are we trying to prevent deaths? Are we trying to prevent hospitalizations? Are we trying to reduce the life years lost? Uh, are we trying to rescue the economy? Um, uh, and even if we're, we understand that we're focused initially on deaths and hospitalizations, how do we best impact on that? Is it healthcare workers? Is it the elderly, which is the primary risk factor for severe disease? 
and picks up a lot of the morbidities on what's operationally possible. Um, uh, it's all very well having a very well targeted strategy, but if you can't identify those people and get them and immunize them efficiently, then it's just, uh, uh, it's, it's pie in the sky. We need the people, we need the equipment, we've got vaccines coming through that have very stringent cold storage requirements. Uh, those are quite atypical and different from what we're used to and need to be put in place. And then as has been mentioned already, uh, are people actually going to want these vaccines when they arrive? Um, there are clearly some people who will not have vaccines, whatever you do, but there are a lot of people who will just really want to establish some kind of clarity about how these vaccines are working and whether there are problems before they opt in. Uh, on the other hand, initially, demand will almost certainly exceed supply because there will be a lot of very frightened, particularly elderly people, uh, and who've been very oppressed by the needing to shield, who will want to receive protection as soon as possible. So really quite interesting and dynamic balance of supply and demand. <clears throat> so I I'm gonna stop here, <clears throat> uh, having raised a whole bunch of questions. I think in summary, um, we need vaccines to accelerate the exit from this pandemic, which otherwise will take years. Um, but vaccines are in many respects handicapped by their former successes. Uh, people have forgotten about the diseases that used to exist uh, and therefore don't value the vaccines that we currently use and the impact they have on our quality of life and the life we've, we've got used to living. Uh, vaccines reputation is just far short uh, of what it ought to be. Vaccines have done more for our health than any other health intervention. It's up there with clean water uh, and safe housing. Um, and yet we spend our time worrying about much more uh, fancy medical interventions that cost a lot and save many fewer lives. Um, certainties and absolutes are widely demanded around vaccines and they're simply not available. Uh, you know, we can give some information, but we all have to get used to making value judgments, uh, risk benefit judgments here. You can't just go out and tell people that these vaccines are, are perfect in every way because we just don't know that. We have to make a judgment. Um, and finally, the early trials and the early phases that we've been going through this year are going to turn out to be the easy part. It's going to get more difficult as we go forward uh, to work out how to do this, how to do trials in the context of vaccines being there and how to use these vaccines effectively and equitably, not only nationally, but globally uh, as we go forward into the next year. It's going to be a, a, an interesting and complicated time. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Adam. Really clear and thought-provoking talk. And I'm sure that I know there are lots of questions already on the Q&A. So the final speaker in this session is Peter Horby, who's Professor of Emerging Infectious Disease and Global Health at the University of Oxford. And as we'll no doubt hear, leads the recovery trial of interventions for uh, people with COVID-19. Um, Peter and I were actually working on a paper back in January when he told me that, unfortunately, he didn't see himself as available, um, as likely to be available to finish it off in the foreseeable future. I don't know whether he knew exactly what he was in for, but I certainly didn't at that stage. And, and I, one of the things that I've uh, found uh, trying to communicate to people who aren't involved in the research in research is the extraordinary and unprecedented pace at which new knowledge has been has been acquired. Uh, Adams talked about that in the context of vaccines, but um, Peter and his colleagues and their achievements in in the recovery trial remain uh, a premier example of that. Over to you, Peter. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, can you see my slides? <coughs> yes. Okay, great. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so <clears throat> I'll, I'll do a quick run through of this because there's much more data than I've got time to present about, about treatments that are ineffective, effective or, or not known, but just a bit, a bit of background. Um, you know, not all viral infections are the same and s s COVID is not like flu and, and COVID is also not like SARS-1. And so the interventions you use may differ. You know, what we see in, in COVID is that the, the viral replication peaks quite early, it peaks much later in SARS-1. And so we may expect in hospitalised patients um, antivirals to be less effective. And also what we're seeing is, is um, 
other aspects of disease that, that are more prominent in COVID, including inflammation, but also coagulation. So, you know, where are we going to um, act to treat COVID disease? I mean, there's lots of points of, of, of action, and this is just some of the drugs that have been proposed. There's a list of thousands that have been proposed, um, some more sensible than others. But there's a whole bunch of um, antiviral drugs that um, are purported to work at you know, either the binding of the virus to the cell and then various points in the process of, of replication within the cell with you know, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine um, acting around this endocytosis. And then you've got um, viral inhibitors of polymerase and proteases here. So that's the antivirals. Then you get the anti-inflammatories because there's a strong anti-inflammation. Uh, um, uh, and so you have various drugs like steroids and this, the very targeted antivirals, like um, sorry, anti-inflammatories like tocilizumab. More recently, we have the, the, the convalescent plasma and monoclonals, which are really sort of antiviral in action in one sense, and they bind to the outside of the virus and prevent, uh, reduce the risk of it infecting cells. But they also bind to the, to the virus and activate the immune system, so they have a dual sort of mode of action. And finally, the antiplatelets and anticoagulants, because we, what we have seen, which perhaps was a bit surprising, was the, the level of, of, um, of um, thrombosis in these patients. And so that's a new target. So there's really three classes, antivirals, anti-inflammatories, antithrombotics, but also there's the, the renin-angiotensin system because the virus binds to the ACE2 receptor. But I won't talk about that because at the moment, I don't think there's, there's much to say there. Um, because the talks about we, what the knowns and unknowns and evidence-based medicine, I, I, you know, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about some of the politicization of science and how that's really um, been extremely unhelpful. Um, hydroxychloroquine is the great example where you know, President Trump said he thinks it's work, it works. He managed to convince some of his aides that it works who were very aggressive about promoting it. Um, in Brazil, it was also politically promoted. And even yesterday, um, the US were having a, an inquiry into hydroxychloroquine in which there were more people speaking in favor of it than against it, um, based on personal experience and not data. Um, and we've seen the same with convalescent plasma. Um, this is the, the FDA administrator talking up and, uh, about giving convalescent plasma an emergency use authorization, um, getting his numbers wrong, saying that 35% um, rate of um, saving lives, which was completely wrong. It was based on non-randomized observational data of early versus late plasma. Um, and more than 200,000 patients have been treated with convalescent plasma in the US um, outside of clinical trials. And we've got no idea if it works or not. Um, so the antivirals, um, this is on the right is a picture of, of um, what was recommended in May. We did a review of clinical um, guidance in May what's interesting is that, you know, there's a number of antivirals recommended um, in different treatment guidelines, including lipinavir, ritonavir, hydroxychloroquine, remdesivir, based on no evidence. Um, so there was a real jump to use drugs off-label without any evidence base. And what you'll know is that most of those, well, in fact, all of those have been shown not to be effective. So this was the result from the, the um, R trial, the recovery trial of, you know, four and a half thousand patients that hydroxychloroquine did not improve mortality. Um, in fact, whatever we looked at, it didn't have any benefit. In fact, it possibly had a harm. Um, that was subsequently um, confirmed the, precisely the same result in the independent WHO solidarity trial of about 1800 patients. Um, and the response has been amazing. Um, you know, we've had vitriolic, terrible uh, you know, response from the hydroxychloroquine believers. This is, us, you know, this is you know, just one example where we've been praised as, as, do, you know, as doing death trials and, and being accused of, of murdering people and saying we should have to go on trial. Um, this is one of my favourites um, where um, the, um, um, I, I'm apparently a controversial character and I'm accused um, of, of grossly misleading negative trials. Um, so it's, it's amazing how the entire sort of structure of evidence-based medicine is, 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 is almost being challenged um, and accepted by politicians. And I have seen this previously in Ebola. There was all sorts of conspiracy theories, but it really needs to be incredibly rigorously defended. 
um, because you know the evidence is there to, um, for itself. This is a, um, the randomised trials of, of hydroxychloroquine. It does not work, whatever dose you use uh, in hospitalised patients. Now we can't say it doesn't work in outpatients, but uh, that remains to be seen. But it's very clear that in inpatients it does not work. Um, lipinavir, ritonavir, again widely used, has not achieved as much attention. You know, thankfully. Um, again, this is our trial from recovery of um, nearly 5,000 patients showing it doesn't work. Again, the, the, the WHO solidarity trial found exactly the same result, that, that it's not effective. And just yesterday, um, remap CAP, the ICU trial, the International ICU Platform trial, announced that they've also <clears throat> suspended their lopinavir ritonavir um, treatment because they found it to be ineffective. So that's another one that's been ditched but um, without the, the politics, thankfully. Um, rem remdesivir is another interesting one um, with hot news off the press. This was another one that was announced um, as being effective based on, on a good trial, a randomized placebo controlled um, trial. And on the basis of that, it was um, approved by the FDA and the European Medicines Agency. Normally the agencies would require results from more than one RCT, but based on the situation, we found ourselves in um, accepted results from one uh, well-conducted trial to, to register the drug. And what that trial showed was a four days improvement in time to recovery, uh, but no benefit on mortality. Um, and this just shows you, um, you know, the, the, the kaplan near plots on time to recovery um, from that, that paper, showing that um, you know, the benefit was most in, in patients on oxygen, but not in more severe patients. But the cat was put amongst the pigeons a bit when the, um, the, the much larger um, solidarity trial, the WHO trial, reported their results of remdesivir, showing um, no, no effect of remdesivir on mortality in, in a much larger number of patients, you know, um, almost 6,000 patients. And this was the, um, the meta-analysis that was included in the preprint of the WHO solidarity trial, um, showing that when you put together the solidarity trial with, with that, the first US trial, and then a much smaller trial I was involved in in, in <coughs> China and um, another trial, really the, the benefits on mortality were um, not statistically significant, a, a possible effect, but perhaps marginal. And so today, the WHO have released um, another meta-analysis where they said done in more detail um, had a look across the four trials um, as part of their evidence review and guidelines development. Um, and what they've recommended today is that remdesivir is not given to hospitalised patients with um, COVID-19, uh, patients with any severity. They looked across the four trials in all these domains down here, mortality, mechanical ventilation, um, viral clearance, time to clinical improvement, hospital duration, and concluded there was no important difference um, by using remdesivir and on the basis that there's, there was no strong evidence of any benefit um, in any um, important clinical outcomes um, and the fact that it's quite an expensive drug and it requires intravenous infusion for five to ten days they could not recommend it um, and so there's a press release um, that was released this morning saying that um, there's currently no evidence that remdesivir improves survival and other important measures and should not be recommended. So this, um, I think, shows you the importance of, of, of waiting for high quality data from uh, a number of studies that, that are confirmatory before um, jumping to conclusions. And the regulatory bodies have um, understandably um, been accepting lower quality evidence than they would usually accept. But it does show that there is a risk in that, that you will end up in a situation where you have a drug approved that the, the accumulating data suggests um, that may have been premature approval. I'm um, going on to anti-inflammatories. This shows you the situation for anti-inflammatories in May this year, where corticosteroids are routinely not recommended in a, in, in a coronavirus infections. Um, and this was the results from the recovery trial showing that um, up here in patients who are um, uh, on ICU or required oxygen, um, there was a clear benefit in terms of reduced risk of death, um, but not in patients who didn't requ require oxygen. 
Um, this was then looked at um, in a meta-analysis that, that Jonathan led um, <clears throat> of different trials in critically ill patients. So this is the meta-analysis was just a subset of patients with critical illness. But the, um, the results were all, all consistent, that dexamethasone or, or other steroids, hydroxychloroquine, methylprednisolone, do have a mortality benefit <clears throat> in patients with COVID-19, and the meta-analysis overall was consistent with um, the recovery trial. And in the, the BMJ today, the, um, the WHO recommendations um, were, were against remdesivir, but supporting um, corticosteroids, they've sort of re-looked re at that, um, showing that there is um, a mortality benefit in critical illness and severe illness. So in patients with severe critical COVID-19, corticosteroids are recommended. So this is the current situation, um, WHO recommendations, remdesivir not recommended, corticosteroids are recommended in patients with moderate or severe disease. Um, just moving on to, uh, I think, one more drug before I close is, is tocilizumab, for which there is uh, data accumulating, which is an anti-IL-6 um, drug, so it's a very targeted anti-inflammatory. Um, and there's sort of a mixed picture of uh, has, has been um, coming out. So there, there were four randomised controlled trials um, as of yesterday. Um, with not very big numbers here, um, you know, 120, 131, 453.89, um, <clears throat> mostly severely, moderately or severely ill patients, and a mixed bag of results. Um, so in, in the first one, um, by Salvarini, the, the threshold for efficacy was not met. Um, in the second trial, the Corimuno trial, um, the first um, efficacy threshold of Severity score was not met, but survival without non-invasive ventilation or mechanical ventilation was met. Sorry, excuse me. Um, and then two industry-sponsored trials, Covactor and Pactor, um, one of which um, did not meet its threshold primary endpoint, but did meet some of the secondary endpoints. And the second, the Impactor, where death or mechanical ventilation was the primary outcome, the threshold for efficacy was met. So a mixed mixed bag. And and just yesterday. Remap Cap announced that they were, have been advised by the, the Data Monitoring Committee to um, stop enrolment to tocilizumab um, based on the fact that the trial data yielded an estimated odds ratio of 1.87 for better outcome with tocilizumab compared to, to no immune modulation. Now, this is um, it's a it's a Bayesian trial um, with adaptive randomization, so we don't actually at this time know the number of patients given tocilizumab and who they're compared to and the number who had the primary outcome or not, only that the, that the Bayesian analysis reports um, um, quite a high odds ratio of benefit. So I think it, we should wait to see um, more details of those, those results. So in summary, you know, the, the early treatment um, was, was wrong. Um, hydroxychloroquine and lopinavir were being used and recommended in treatment guidelines and both of those have been shown conclusively not to work in hospitalised patients and should not be used. Um, corticosteroids were not recommended. Um, a number of trials now together have shown that they are effective in patients hospitalised with moderate severe disease. And then we've got this, this very big grey area in the middle. I think remdesivir was in the go. It's now drifting down towards the no-go, um, particularly based on the risk-benefit analysis. Tocilizumab is drifting up towards being beneficial, but we need a bit more data on that. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff in the middle for which there is um, poor quality data at the moment, convalescent plans and monoclonal antibodies, antithrombotics, interferons, where um, they may or not may not be beneficial. And we really have to await the outcomes of randomised controlled trials. And there's a lot of observation data out there, but really has to be treated with great caution. Um, thank you very much, Jonathan. Thanks very much, Peter, for that superb talk. Um, I'm going to ask Sarah to uh, take us through some of the questions in a moment, but um, Adam was an example to us all in the, and, and Adam and Lucy, maybe you could switch your screens on at this point. Adam was an example to us all um, in that he, uh, he offered uh, the examples of where he'd been wrong. So I'll, I'll invite uh, Lucy and Peter also to say things they got wrong. My own is that uh, in July, I, I've been treated for the first time in a very long time with some respect by my children because they decided that what I did might be a little bit interesting after all this year. And 
in, in July and August, I very confidently told them that there wouldn't be a second wave because we'd learned so much already that there's no way we'd allow it to get out of control again. So that's my one. I don't know, I don't know. Lucy, do you want to offer something that you got wrong? Um, it sounds bad to say this, but actually I've been so unaware, I've been so aware of the unknowns and my own uncertainty that I haven't made any confident predictions at all. So I think I avoided being wrong by, by that. Well, we know now, we know that George would trust you for not expressing strong certainty on anything. What about you, Peter? Um, well, I think you've made mistakes. You know, the early trials in China were, um, you know, because I was involved with remdesivir and, and lipinavir and tonavir in China, and they, they were just too small. We should have been much more aggressive at making them much bigger because we'd have had much clearer answers early on because um, I think we were near the answers. You know, we were, we were in, in line with what we know now, but they just weren't big enough and we should have been much more aggressive to get the patients in and, and resisted um, closing too early. And I think we've learned that lesson and have not repeated it in recovery. Uh, and I think in recovery, we're being pretty strict. You know, we've asked the DMC, please don't, don't tell us to stop unless it's absolutely barn door. Yes. And part of that goes back to the history of large simple trials, as, as, was, as was pointed out recently uh, from Sir Richard Pito <coughs> back from the 1980s. So science is relearning some old lessons there. <laughs> OK, over to you, Sarah. And uh, so, uh, you're going to have a hard job picking questions. We'll get as many as we can in. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, certainly there's a, been a host of brilliant questions that have come through. Um, so I guess probably to Lucy to start with there, one question that came through is um, thinking about sort of the behaviours in society, what, what, what do we know or how much do we know about how well people are coping living in, in, in a society at the moment with, with such unknowns and with such changes in behaviour? That's a really excellent question. Um, I think you can answer that at various levels. So there's the question about how as a society and in terms of sort of making policy and so on, uh, are we coping with it? And um, I think that uh, today is very much a response to the problem that George saw, which is that um, this polarization towards certainties uh, that you're seeing among uh, the people who are responsible for giving advice and, and making policy. Um, and that that's actually a, a rather strange and inappropriate uh, response to our situation of such uncertainty. So I think um, we're not necessarily uh, accepting and communicating the degree to which we do have to live with uncertainty, however uncomfortable that is. Um, at another level, um, there are also difficulties uh, because people uh, are not very uh, enthusiastic about seeing changes to advice. So if we change, for example, the advice on NPIs, people think that undermines the credibility of giving advice, even when it's uh, sometimes based on a real change in the situation or a, a change in our knowledge and, and us gaining new knowledge. So uh, it, it, people aren't very receptive to having uncertainty communicated. And, and a third problem with coping with it is that uh, when people feel there is a lot of threat in the situation and that it's very complex and uncertain, then they sometimes try to hang on to uh, apparent certainties, which makes them more open to misinformation and to developing extreme views um, that aren't very well grounded. Uh, so there's all sorts of problems to do with uh, us trying to cope with these unknowns. Thank you. Thanks, Lucy. Back to you, Sarah. Um, so I guess, again, perhaps not surprisingly, there's been a lot of talk with, with vaccines on the horizon about how those are going to be rolled out and, and public uptake and public trust in vaccines. So um, Adam, to you, just putting some of these themes together, uh, what can we do to really be combating that misinformation that's out there, targeting risk groups and maximising vaccine, vaccine uptake? And um, to what extent should vaccination be compulsory? Uh, well, the, the, the misinformation question is one that's been knocking around already for more than 10 years. I mean, it's obviously been amplified in this crisis, but we've had serious problems um, historically with 
people pushing out wrong information and misleading information about vaccines. Uh, and I think one of the reasons for that, aside from the usual, you know, nonsense about social media and how that's amplified the problem, uh, is that, as I said in, in the talk, vaccines are a victim of their own success. So whereas in the 1960s, people would queue up around the block to get their children immunized against polio because they, they knew about the risks of polio and likewise whooping cough. Today's parents have never seen or heard of any of these illnesses and don't really understand why the vaccines are important. Um, in terms of the mandatory question, uh, this, this has come up again recently quite, quite a bit in the UK. Um, I think the consensus in this country is that we have such a successful vaccination programme with such uh, high levels of buy-in, such an efficient system through the NHS of providing these vaccines centrally purchased at low cost through a highly well-trusted primary care delivery system, that it's really hard to see how we could improve on that. And, and, and there was even a risk that we could make it worse by making people suspicious that somehow they're being compelled to do something that they would otherwise do anyway. I mean, the, 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 the kind of majorities we get for immunization programs in childhood are in the mid to high 90s. These are majorities that politicians can only dream of. Um, so, so I think there's a, a high level of skepticism about compulsion in this country, although some people want to try it. Other countries have done this. I mean, the, the, the Americans have effectively compelled their parents to have their children immunized for many years. And they're very into compelling um, healthcare workers to be immunized, for example, against flu. And that's very much part of their culture. The Australians have been withholding benefits for many years from people who don't have their children immunized. So, you know, there are differences from one country to another, but uh, I'm certainly not a fan of compulsion and I don't think it's necessary in this country. And I think in the short term, we're going to see demand for these vaccines uh, massively exceeding supply. So compulsion would be a bit absurd in that situation. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Thanks. Um, Peter, there, I'm sure there are questions for you, but I have noticed a couple on the chat that you might want to quickly deal with. So there have been, been quite a few questions about vitamin D and also about antithrombotics. Do you want to comment quickly on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, thrombosis is something that you know, has was not, I don't think, expected as a massive problem, but it's become apparent that it is, you know, seems to be a specific problem with severe COVID. And so there are questions about what anti-thrombotics anti, um, to use. Certainly, I think all patients hospitalised should be on thromboprophylaxis, so prophylactic heparin. The question is whether that then is whether you should have just prophylactic doses or therapeutic doses, and then whether you should add in aspirin. Um, so there are trials looking at those. So there's so, so Remap Cap is looking at um, prophylactic dose heparin versus therapeutic dose, and in recovery we're looking at aspirin. So I think that's a space to watch, and I'm quite excited to see the results of that. Um, what was the other question, Jonathan? Vitamin D has come up quite a few D. times. Yeah. So, um, so there's so in the UK we have this, this committee called CTAP that looks at all, all the proposed products, and there's a very long list, and there's now I think five subgroups. And one of those looked at this, has looked at vitamin D recently. Um, I think the issue with vitamin D is that um, if it's going to, you know, there, there is a rationale for why it might it, it might be associated with susceptibility to, to, to respiratory viral infections, but probably if it's going to have an effect, it's something that you want to target very early, prior to hospitalisation. So I don't think it's something that's likely to have a benefit by the time you're in hospital. If you're going to do anything, it should be much earlier. You know, to make sure people aren't deficient in vitamin D. Thank you. Back to you, Sarah. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, somebody has asked around, and it's this balancing information again, around how we get those that trial data out from, from patients who have got negative, uh, negative results from late stage trials uh, against sort of making sure that we're still progressing medications in earlier stage disease that, that might be relevant there. It's just balancing that. Um, communication. What can we what can we do to make sure that we're not um, sort of preventing earlier stage research? Essentially, just answer that, John. I mean, I think that's sure. important. I tried to caveat, you know, all, all my talk about hospitalised patients, you know, and so um, you know, it's the right drug at the right dose in, in the right patient at the right time. You know, steroids clearly worked in severe disease, but clearly didn't work in in patients who were not very sick and actually might have been harmful. 
it just shows you that it really depends when you give it. And so um, we have to remember that the results apply to the patient group in which they were tested and, not, and you can't extrapolate that to every patient or much earlier disease. Got time for a couple more, Sarah? Sure. Um, going back to, to vaccines sort of coming out the other end of this, what, what role do we think vaccines are going to be playing in our exit strategy and, and around the role of immunity or vaccine passports and, and how that might work? I guess that's to Adam uh, primarily. Yeah, OK. So, so I think uh, there, are, there are two initial phases to this. Uh, one is uh, to try to uh, impact on the uh, the problems that are driving the lockdowns at the moment, which is essentially high numbers of cases in high risk individuals and protecting those that care for them. So that's phase one. Um, phase two, uh, based on what the experience in phase one, I think to some extent, will be to broaden that out much more widely. Again, focusing on people who are more moderately en enhanced risk, but still focusing on direct protection targeted protection of people who we want to protect. Uh, the third phase, I think, will be potentially moving into trying to really reduce circulation of the virus more broadly. We need a lot more vaccine for that, uh, and we need to know more clearly how well these vaccines will be able to impact on that. I think if you're going to offer a vaccine to a 20-year-old whose risk of uh, getting seriously ill with COVID are far lower, or, I mean, they're almost non-existent, you, you need to be clear to them as to what the purpose is of doing that. Um, and the primary purpose would be to try and um, help them, help everyone bring life back to normal by getting rid of this virus from circulating. Um, I think the questions about sort of passports and travel and all the rest are slightly peripheral to this because we, until we really know how these vaccines behave, um, you know, we won't be able to legislate for how reliably they'll, they'll solve that problem. I think in the short term, travel and so on is going to be much more around um, <clears throat> efficient delivery of testing that, that can be used to uh, avoid quarantining and allow people to travel a bit more. But yeah, those, are, those I think are the phases broadly that we're going to see and hopefully we can bring an end to these sine waves of, of, of outbreaks and lockdowns that we're witnessing at the moment. Thanks very much, Adam. Well, the organizers of this meeting have have allocated an extraordinarily mean amount of time for lunch. So I'm going to make sure that we finish at 12.45 promptly, uh, and I'll hand back to Phil in a moment. But on the theme of the meeting and really drawing on these, these three fantastic presentations, uh, if there's one for, 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 for people who are not necessarily from a research background who are participating, I hope you've seen that acknowledgement of uncertainty is absolutely fundamental to the way that scientists have approached this epidemic and will continue to be so. Um, thank you very much indeed to Lucy, to Adam and to Peter and back to you, Phil.